Hello, I'm Daniel Sabo, and this is the Thursday reading. Peter Morris, Chapter 4, Part 2. If one may say so, a blue sea wave swelled under his heart. He had not seen the sea, but what he was seeing now was what he had been painting for quite a while. She had the je ne sais quoi that he was hoping to find in a girl. He had never been able to pinpoint what he liked in a woman, but most of the time he knew very well what he did not like. Maybe this Zoldi could be the one, though he did not really know if he believed in the one. Her chestnut head of hair was like... He did not want to be caught with his mouth agape, so he intentionally postponed the simile and answered the question awkwardly enough. Morris! Peter Morris! Like a president of the United States? Maurice Peter Morris? Maybe the name of an old historian specialized in ancient Greece? No, I am just Peter Morris. You can call me Peter. I think I'd rather call you Peter Morris. Or Maurice. Tell me about yourself, Peter Morris. Well, I do not want to talk too much. I am not very good at it. It may deter you from speaking to me any further. Wow. Do you always speak like that? It is exactly what I was fearing. I do not speak that often. So I am not sure I have developed an idiosyncratic way of speaking. I have certainly developed an idiosyncratic way of not speaking. The silence you were talking about before, I often use it to form sentences I could use if I did speak to people. But I usually choose not to. You see, choose, for example, is not the right word, because I do not really choose not to speak. It just happens. You know what just happened, Peter Morris? I've just met someone really interesting, and I think I'm going to like him very much. It was difficult for Peter to believe what he was hearing. Was this happening to him? Peter Morris? Zoldi, I need to warn you that I usually mess up. Once, I asked a girl if she would marry me. We were quite young, and I thought I was in love. I did not mean to marry her straight off. It was more of a philosophical question. That's cute. What did she say? A bit like you when we first met. You mean she didn't say anything? Exactly. She did not say a word. She started walking really fast, and I followed her. I did not want to be a pathetic dog with a hanging tongue, but I knew I was, and I did not know how not to be. We arrived at the train station. She said, ciao, and got into the train. The memory was painful. He had stood there on the platform like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, waiting for Ingrid Bergman. Paris in black and white, the rain, the steam, hat and cigarette. Peter Morris had none of the above. Don't tell me you never saw her again. I did, but we never got married, and she never answered the question. Peter Morris, you are a funny man. Zoldi took Peter Morris's hand and kissed it. He was touched by the gesture, although he was not sure whether it meant pity, friendship or something else. Peter Morris had never asked a girl for her phone number. He had never arranged a meeting with a girl or gone on a date. How did people do that? The conversation had been so nice. Yes, nice. Not awkward like he was supposed to be. Had he fallen in love? He could not answer the question, since he did not understand these words, to fall in love. Even when dazzled by the morning sun, he had not fallen on his knees like Saul. Silence. She had certainly broken the silence and flooded him with words. Original, inventive, quick, alive. He had spoken as well. Quite naturally so. Well, almost naturally. He had even told her a story that she had seemed to find reasonably interesting. She had used the word funny to describe him. Was that positive? What about when she had said something about liking him very much? That was good, was it not? I feel like asking you what you're thinking about. I bet you often think too much, Maurice. And quite conspicuously so. Perhaps you need to learn to enjoy more and think a bit less. Not that thinking is a bad thing, 
Just don't think when you're enjoying something. But maybe you need to think to enjoy. What do you think? She was quick. Very quick. Quite unlike him. Was she right about him thinking too much? I often hear people say they think too much. But I do not think it is true. If they thought more, they would not say or do the things they say and do. I like thinking. That is probably one of the things I enjoy most. I think I am quite good at it. Definitely better than at talking. It does not necessarily make me happy, but I enjoy it. So if you ask me to think less, to enjoy more, it seems quite paradoxical to me. But then paradoxes are essential and I think I am not afraid of them. It's funny. I'm not surprised that you're not afraid of paradoxes. You don't seem scared. You just seem like you don't know what you're supposed to do. That was quite perceptive of her. She seemed able to understand him. That is my main problem. I do not know what I am supposed to do. What am I supposed to do, Zoldi? What am I supposed to say when I am enjoying something so much that it is almost hard to enjoy it until it is finished? He knew that when he would go home and start painting, he would be happy because he had talked to her, even though he might not know what to do when they met again. With paint on his fingers, he would be able to reflect on this conversation. But right now, as he was speaking, it was difficult for him to say exactly what he wanted to say. She made it easier, it was true, because she seemed to understand him a little. She seemed interested in trying to understand him, at least, contrary to most people. I don't think you're supposed to do anything, Peter Morris. That's the thing. Maybe people expect things from you. Not necessarily, because I do not give them the opportunity. Well, maybe you expect things from yourself. Or maybe you think the God you mention expects things from you, which makes you feel guilty, as you probably don't live up to his expectations. I prefer freedom. Freedom from guilt and moral constraints. It was true that she seemed much freer than him. I actually have to go now. She was so free, she was going to leave him just like that. But don't worry, I'm sure we'll meet again. He would have liked her to stay longer. And even if it was not easy to talk, he would have liked to talk some more. But he could not admit that yet. His former failures were too vivid in his mind. I am not worried. I just ask myself questions. But I am not afraid if I do not have the answers. Sometimes you seem so confident. And the next minute, you're like a lost child looking for his mother. She was probably right. But Peter found her last words slightly irritating. It did not really matter. She had made him talk. He enjoyed her conversation. He felt neither superior nor inferior. They had brushed each other with their words. Language was like a skin. She had rubbed her skin against his. And his language had shaken with desire. As announced, she walked away. She did not walk fast. She almost trudged away, as though mortally injured. There was sadness in her gait, and yet it was Peter Morris who was injured. Not mortally, though. An injury as tasty as melancholy. Why was this happening now? He had only been interested in the tiger. He had fled suffering when his parents had died by believing in heaven childishly. He had not missed them too much, as he had always been quite independent. He had not even been that sad. Was suffering about to welcome itself in his long, gawky frame? Il n'y a d'absence que de l'autre. C'est l'autre qui part. C'est moi qui reste. He was the sedentary one, like a lost package in a remote corner of a train station waiting to be found. Forgetting Zoldi momentarily was the only way he could bear her presence. But suffering was so sweet. He was starting to enjoy the fall. He did not want to forget. Another way to suffer this, French, this fresh absence was to conjure up her presence by thinking of her, repeating her words to himself, reminiscing her chestnut head of hair.